Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, happy Atheist Day. It's just a little joke for my atheist friends out there. Before we begin this study, because we're going to continue looking at Daniel chapter 11, verse 30 and 31. Uh, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful for the time that we have in studying together. And we invite your spirit's presence and we pray for those that we sometimes uh, make fun of, for those that don't believe in you. We know, Lord, we have many family and friends who have doubts about your existence. And we know, Lord, that in order for us to to reach their hearts, we need to be able to represent your character. So we pray for them, lift them up in prayer. And we pray for one another. We know that we all face struggles in this world of sin and suffering, uh, trials that try our faith. So we just pray, Lord, for your spirit uh, to speak to our hearts and minds, to bring a conviction into our lives and a power uh, to overcome the sins that so easily beset us. Um, we pray for your spirit to direct the study today, that we can understand the things that we are studying and that we can have a correct understanding of them. Uh, be with us now. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Good morning again. Now, I've done a bit of thinking. Uh, my paper on uh, the eclipses is up on my academia site, and I did put a link to it uh, on the video from yesterday, from yesterday, from Sabbath. So if anybody wants to go look at that, they can. So I spent a bit of time thinking about this, and I knew I must be on the wrong track somewhere. So... So I decided I needed to look at this a bit more carefully. And, and that is in the historic application of how we take this. So the ships of Kittim, um, we were attaching to, I think we were attaching it to the Vandals. I'm not sure. I think that's what Stephen had done. So I wished he would be here. But when we deal with the ships of Kittim, if we're go going to look at the seven trumpets. So I'm going to go there. Look at so this is my paper on the seven trumpets. So we had these, the first, second, third, and fourth trumpet. You can see that these are going to be judgments against Western Rome. And we have the Goths or the Visigoths, the Vandals, the Huns, and the Heruli. And these are in Revelation chapter eight. Now, this, this map here just deals with the th three parts of Rome. So the city's divided into three parts. And you can see that it's th this part here, what we call Western Rome, that's going to be attacked under the first four trumpets. We have Eastern Rome over here. Um, and then we have uh, Elicrium is that pink uh, area. Now, what these maps are going to show is they're going to show the Gothic invasion, Invasion, so you have the Eastern Goths and the Western Goths, uh, so the, the Eastern Goths or the Visigoths, and they're going to, uh, come down from the north. So these are going to be the first Germanic tribes that come in, and they're going to go into Elicrium as well, as well as Western Rome. And then we have the Vandals. Now the Vandals are the ones that Uriah Smith attaches as being the ships of Kittim. So that means the other ones are ignored. Yes. Yeah, so this is, and these are going to be around the same time. So I can't remember what Stephen was saying about this, but, and because I'm not an expert on this, this history, wish I was, but anyway, and we also have the Svet Svebi over here. There's Carthage. Now, so you're going to have them coming out of Carthage and they're going to be waging or against uh, Western Rome. And then you have the Huns that follow. This is going to be about 50 years later. And they're going to come. They, again, they're a Germanic people coming in over the mountains here, whatever those mountains are called. I can't remember what they're called. In Italy, finally, you have the Heruli, which, you know, are another 25 years or so later. And um, uh, they're going to come across through Illyricum. I think that's how you say it. Lycrium, um, and they're going to occupy Italy. And this is, of course, going to be the fall of Western Rome in this history, right? So that means they're going to finally, 
in these four different invasions finally be conquered. So when we look at this interpretation that we had of uh, Daniel chapter 11, hi Dwight, and if the ships of Kitten are actually referring not to uh, the Goths, but to the Vandals, I mean, they're still part of the Germanic tribal invasion. But if we just did this and we said they're the Vandals, then what we have is we have, in this case, we're not having the Visigoths being mentioned, even though they're mentioned in Revelation. Then we have these three uh, steps. Now, one of the things that, that I did here before we started the video is I crossed out the word therefore and I put the word and. Um, so I have in which the ships of Kittim shall come against him and he shall be grieved. I would still uh, keep this. I, and, and, and it's not now why I cross out therefore is because it's just not there. It's not there in, in the Hebrew. And, and the idea of therefore is, you know, maybe you could say it's implied, but I'm just being <coughs> a little bit technical. And he now we have Western Rome. Right. So he's the one uh, that's going to be grieved and he's going to return and have indignation. Now, Western Rome, of course, we know is still pagan Rome. This is not the papacy. Now we have him being grieved and then returning. Now the returning, um, Stephen had attached this to 410 AD and just the response to, and I thought it was a response, response to the Visigoths. So now they're still about the same time. In, in my maps there, I have them both about 400 AD. So the Visigoths and the Vandals are in that same history. I'm, I'm still troubled with this Greek. Now, one, one of the things that I, I thought about it is, um, you know, that this grieving in return could maybe refer to the other judgments. So the first one is, is we have the ships of Kitten being the Vandals. And then we're going to have the Huns and then the Heruli. And I don't know. So we're going to have Genseric. And, and this is how it's applied. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to think how, how Uri Smith does it. I think what he does is he puts this all as the Vandals. I don't think he's going to include the Huns and the Heruli in this. So this being grieved, how does he say it? I'm just looking here for what he says. So I'll go there. So Uriah Smith says, the prophetic narrative still has reference to the power which has been the subject of the prophecy from the 16th verse, namely Rome. What were the ships of Kittim that came against this power, and when was this movement made? What country or power is meant by Kittim? Adam Clark has, has this note on Isaiah 23, verse 1, from the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. Uh, the news of the destruction of Tyre by Nebuchadnezzar is said to be brought to them from Kittim, the islands and coasts of the Mediterranean. For the Tyr Tyrians, said Jerome in verse 6, when they saw they had no other means of escaping, fled in their ships and took refuge in Carthage and in the isles of the Ionian and Aegean Sea. So also... Uh, Yarchi, that's another commentator on the same place, and Kiddo, another commentator gives the same locality to Kittim, the coast and islands of the Mediterranean. And the mind is carried by the testimony of Jerome to a definite and celebrated city situated in that region, that is Carthage, uh, was a naval warfare with Carthage as a base of operations ever waged against the Roman Empire. We think of the terrible onslaught of the Vandals upon Rome under the fierce Genseric and answer readily in the affirmative. Every spring he sallied forth from the port of Carthage at the head of his large and well-disciplined naval, for naval forces, spreading consternation through all the maritime provinces of the empire. That this is the work brought to view is further evident when we consider that we are brought down in the prophecy to this very time. In verse 29, the transfer of empire to Constantinople we understood to be mentioned, following the due course of time as the next remarkable revolution came to eruptions of the barbarians of the north prominent among them, which was the van and the war already mentioned the years ad 728 to 477 marked the career of genseric he shall be grieved and return may have reference to the de desperate efforts which were made to dispossess 
Genseric, in the sovereignty of the seas, and the first by uh, Majorian, the second by Pope Leo I, both of which were utter failures. Rome was obliged to submit to the humiliation of seeing its provinces ravaged and its eternal city pillaged by the enemy. So he says to see uh, comments in Revelation 8, verse 8, and that's the one that talks about this, uh, the second angel sounded, right? So that's going to be the second uh, uh, trumpet, right? Which is what, which is the trumpet dealing with the vandals. Um, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea, and the third part of the sea became blood. The third part referring to the third part of Rome, which is Western Rome. Uh, indig indignation against the Holy Covenant. This doubtless refers to attempts to destroy God's covenant by attacking the Holy Scriptures, the Book of the Covenant. A revolution of this nature was accomplished in Rome. The Heruli, Goths, and Vandals, who conquered Rome, embraced the Arian faith and became enemies of the Catholic Church. It was especially for this, for the purpose of exterminating this heresy, that Justinian decreed the Pope to be the head of the Church and the corrector of heretics. The Bible soon came to be regarded as a dangerous book that should not be read by common people, but all questions in dispute were to be submitted to the Pope. This was, thus was indignity heaped upon God's word. Says the historian in commenting upon the attitude of the Catholic Church towards the scriptures, one would have thought that the Church of Rome had removed her people to a safe distance from the scriptures. She had placed the gulf of tradition between them and the word of God. She has removed them still farther from the sphere of danger by providing an infallible interpreter whose duty it is to take care that the Bible shall express no sense hostile to Rome. Uh, but as if this were not enough, she has labored by all means in her power to prevent the scriptures coming in any shape into the hands of the people. Right? So it goes on about this for a while. And then he says the emperors of Rome, the eastern division of which still continued, had intelligence or connived with the church of Rome which had forsaken the covenant and constituted the great apostasy for the purpose of putting down heresy. So he's definitely got, um, and it says the man of sin was raised in his presumptuous throne by the defeat of the Arian Goths. He then held possession of Rome. So this is a little bit more complicated history. And, and here Uriah Smith is talking about, uh, you know, Eastern Rome as being the one, that's going to have intelligence, which makes no sense in the text. So it seems to me there's some problems with what he's saying. So when he says he shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant, he's talking about East, Eastern Rome. And I don't think that makes, makes sense here. Any thoughts on this? So in, in trying to work through this, we know that we, we definitely did not have it all right, that there's things that didn't make sense, that didn't line up, didn't flow very nicely. So if we say that the ships of Kittim refer to the Vandals, and we try to follow that analogy as far as, I mean, I still can say German modernism, but they shall come against the West, Western Rome, and we're saying that's the West. So Western Rome has to symbolize something, you know, that that, that will make sense in the in the present truth application. And so we just, again, we say it's the West. So the West is what's being discussed here in our history, but that's Western Rome. But when he shall be grieved in return, he's still saying that this is in response. This is about the vandals. And so how would we how would we address this then? Does this help us at all what this change that we've made? Now, I would say having indignation against the Holy Covenant, obviously that's going to be a type of persecution against the truth that pagan Rome or Western Rome is going to be exercising as the daily, right? So we could say that what they have is this, this fear of Christianity, right? So it's trying to destroy Christianity. So it's going to have this uh, against the Holy Covenant. So paganism tries to destroy Christianity. So Western Rome is trying to hold on. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I'm puzzled by some of this. 
because there has to be a connection here. So what we have is we have this fall of Western Rome. Now, Western Rome, as you could see when you're dealing with uh, what happens in the fall of Western Rome, is that uh, the papal power is part of the civil power in that history. Right. So we have Western Rome is in control with these different popes. I, I'm still having a hard time wrapping my right, mind around this for some reason. So the Vandals are coming against Western Rome. We have Eastern Rome. Eastern Rome is going to be, you know, separate from Western Rome. And I wish I knew more. I wish I knew more about this history. The thing is, I have studied this. When you don't have a context to understand everything, things just kind of... So when we deal with uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, it's going to start with the Visigoths in 410 and lead ultimately to the sacking of Rome and the fall of Rome in 476 when the chief uh, German chieftain Odiacer deposed the last Roman emperor of the West, Romulus Augustus, right? So so we can see that there is this uh, period of time. It's a 66-year period of time. So I, I think one of the things that we have to mark here is, is where specifically Western Rome falls. So there's a point where West, Western Rome falls, but after Western Rome falls, paganism is still not taken out of the way because paganism is, is taken out of the way in 508. And, and one of the arguments that people have against the idea of 508 is they say, well, Western Rome has already fallen in 476. So how is paganism taken out of the way in 508? Now, of course, we understand Clovis's baptism. Now, Clovis isn't particularly a pagan in in the, the strictest sense, right? I mean, he's Germanic, but he's going to become Christian. He's going to be baptized. So I think there, that there's just this this transition that's needed for these Germanic tribes to become Christian and then also to become Catholic. So the part of the problem I have is these the different players, because we have Western Rome, which exists as these Roman emperors. And then we have after the fall of Rome, that means we don't have a Roman emperor in the West. The Western Rome is is divided in this this history. You know, the symbol of the the ten toes or the ten horns, whatever symbol of ten. Western Rome is what's divided. Not Eastern Rome. Eastern Rome is going to fall later, right? I mean, it's not till uh, 1453 that we have the fall of Eastern Rome. So quite a bit later, I mean, almost a thousand years later, that Eastern Rome falls. Hi, Stephen. Hello, Theodore. Good, good you're here, because I know you, you understand this history better than I do. Okay, yeah, so 977 years. 77 years, what do you say? From when Eastern Rome falls. Oh, 977 years, yes. Which which you have in a diagram, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that get, brings us to that 977 BC symbol. So you have a diagram that shows that structure. Uh, I know I have it somewhere. You could probably bring it up. But anyway, for now, we, we, we want to look at... Um, so when I, I I started really thinking hard about this because I was having so so much trouble trying to make sense out of it all, and I still don't know if I have. Um, but I looked at what Uriah Smith said. So he's going to have the ships of Kittim being the Vandals. Now, now we know that that it starts with the Visigoths that we lead leads to the fall of Western Rome, right? And and so where I had the problem is we have the ships of Kittim. And then we have, they come against, you know, Western Rome. And then we have, he shall be grieved, return and have indignation. And, and to me, those seem like a three step process, right? And then we're going to have, after the fall of Western Rome, paganism is really going to have to be, but you see that there's this change. He shall be grieved, return and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Right. Paganism is trying to destroy Christianity in that history. 
And then it says, so shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence. And I said, well, the doing, the return, and the intelligence are also three steps. So I was trying to sort through that. So I changed it from, you know, uh, just Germanic tribal invasions as the ships of Kittim to be more specific, like Uriah Smith is. The ships of Kittim refer to the vandals, which are going to be under Genseric, um, working out of Carthage. And I know a little bit, I studied, I watched a video, I guess I should say, on those battles. But it didn't mean much to me at the time. I didn't fully understand the context. And if we look at the vandals of, you know, when we think about vandalism, you know, it's destroying things. And German modernism is, is still a good uh, a parallel to the vandalism of the vandals. That makes sense. It's sort of addressing how how modernism has destroyed uh, dependence upon the word of God as the authority for truth. But anyway, so we have these different players. So we have, anyway, what do you think about the vandals being the ships of Kitten? I think that's so I, a, a good analogy. To me, that's what I would think. I okay, think it, con- okay. it connects with the, uh, the third trumpet. Second trumpet. Is it the second? Yeah, second trumpet. Revelation 8.8. 8. <clears throat> So, and, and I think that's actually an interesting uh, point, too, just that it's Revelation 8.8, 8, which I need to put in here somewhere. I'm just going to put it here as a footnote. It's a reference that uh, Uriah Smith gives as well. They were the uh, trumpet bar most associated with ships. Yes. Yeah, it's the one that's associated with the ships because they're going to come out of Carthage and they're going to have all of these continuous year after year pillaging of Western Rome. So we got Revelation 8, 8 there. And so he, he's going to come against Western Rome. Now we're saying in, in the parallel that this is an attack upon the West through a type of philosophy, thinking, whatever you want to call it. And it says, so Western Rome shall be grieved, returned and have indignation against the Holy Covenant. And I was saying we must have, like to me, there, there needs to be something specific about the grieved and the return. Now, Uriah Smith has some applications to that, but uh, I'm, I'm just not, to me, there just seems to be such a structure here, the grieved return and have indignation, this three parts, that we should be more specific. Now, as far as the return, I don't know. We, we had 410 AD, and we had somehow put it over on the other return, the one that comes later in the verse. But but that's going to be the Visigoths, right? That that the the Rome is responding to in 410. Yes. Okay. So I, also, I'm wondering, what? Also the uh, I suppose there will be other tribes as well. Helping in, as well in 410. In 410, that they're responding to just the Germanic invasions in general. Yeah. Well, there was that crossing of the Rhine, sort of uh, <laughs> the last day of 406. Okay. So um, you, had a, you had a host of tribes coming over the Rigai, the Visigoths, and all that. Yeah. So, so in this, um, this, this is just from my paper on the Seven Trumpets. So I have, you know, the Goths under Alaric, Alaric 395 to 410. And then I got uh, here the Vandals 428 to 468. And then um, the Huns from 451 to 453. So they're sort of in the time of the Vandals. They start later, but they end earlier. And then you have the Heruli, which are the ones that bring about the fall of Rome from 476 to 490. And on the 1843 chart, it has 490 as... Just looking at the chart, trying to figure this out. So it has the completion of the Ten Kingdoms. So I'm not sure particularly, and then you can see me there. So we have the completion of the Ten Kingdoms dealing with the chart itself. It talks about, yeah, I popped back into view there magically. Okay, so we got, you know, 476 to 490. So that's going to be from uh, the fall of 
of Rome. So that's and then and then the ten toes, ten kingdoms, whatever, are are made up by 490. But from uh, for this period of time, if we go from 410 to 476, it's 66 year period, and 410 is is Rome's response to these Germanic in, invasions. Is that the idea? Well, that's when they withdrew the tribes from Britain, anyway. Okay. In that year. Yeah, and I think I think that we have to be to me not, that not the, not the tribes, sorry, the uh, the the Romans, the Rome, Rome's kind of rule over Britain. Yeah, yeah. They weren't okay. in Britain so much, although they were attacked, but it was more just what was going on in Europe. They couldn't. There was kind of like a division between the the Romans and Britain, and the Romans. Uh, the, the Franks and all coming in between. Okay, so so we can have the ships of Kittim just symbolizing all of these Germanic invasions, but specifically it's just referring to the to the Vandals, right? But then we have this grieved return and have indignation. Uh, those then, so this being grieved, if we're going to put it in a time. Would it just be when these Germanic invasions begin? So that's going to be before the time of the Vandals, like 395. They're going to be grieved at that time. That's when it's going to start. They're going to respond to that in 410. And then the indignation against the Holy Covenant. This must be once, because we're still dealing with pagan Rome. So pagan Rome. No. So one of the, one of the problems that, as I've mentioned earlier, is just that Western Rome falls in 476. So the question of, well, how does paganism get removed in 508, right? So the criticism is that, you know, Miller was wrong. You know, 508 has nothing to do with um, paganism uh, being removed, right? Because that's going to be 476. You know, Heidi Hikes goes into this quite a bit. But we can see that that paganism, even though the Western Rome has fallen, paganism still is continuing. Right? It's the daily, it's the continuance. You know, so would this be from 476 to 508 that that we see? So if we're dealing with Western Rome, I mean, maybe, you know, because Rome still exists in the East, right? So obviously this has to be Western Rome. Um, so maybe if we did something like, uh, you know, and I would just put in. How did that manifest? What's that? How did that manifest in that history? Well, it's going. It, it, the question is, how does how does it manifest that paganism has indignation against uh, the Holy Covenant? So that's the question. I don't I don't have specific answers to. Right. Okay. That's right. So I, don't, I don't know. All I know is that paganism still must exist in some form. It's just that it's not in control. So so I don't know, but that's that's what I'm saying would have to happen. If we're going to have paganism removed in verse 31 in 508 with the baptism of Clovis, we we then have to try to understand what that means about, about paganism being taken out of the way. So that would be the problem we have to solve. Solve. So paganism uh, will continue to have indignation against the Holy Covenant. If that's the case, what would that be? How is yes. paganism trying to destroy Christianity? So the, that, the, yeah, the empires. The, I'm sorry, the emperors in this year time period um, would generally profess to be Christian, although mm-hmm. probably nominal. Uh, you have Julian the Apostate, but that's the fourth century, uh, where there's a revival of a, a pagan emperor. But after yeah. that, they are sort of professing to have some religion in favor of Christianity. Um, right. So, so this wouldn't so, be the civil power. This would be through some other way. Potentially, yes. Yeah. So. Um, cause what you have is you have, they're gonna, pagans are gonna be persecuted, right? Yes. In the, so if we're saying that they have indignation, now indignation is just anger, right? 
Yes. So they continue to have indignation against Christianity. So maybe it's not that they try to destroy Christianity. They try to defend against Christianity, maybe, is a better way to look at it. But I don't know enough about that history. And, and we have to remember with this history that, that often it's, it's sort of more painted with, you know, the Catholic brush about things. So, you know, when I try to read the history of, of this period, lots of things are left out just because they don't seem to be relevant to the historian. So I'm just looking here what Wikipedia says about this period. Okay, so, yeah, so there is this restoration of paganism by Julian in 361 to 363. He had been co-emperor since 355, and he ruled solely for 18 months from 361 to 363. He was a nephew of Constantine received Christian training, but after childhood, Julian was educated by Hellenists and became attracted to the teachings of the Neoplatonists. Okay, so in that history, you're going to have that. And then you got Jovian uh, to Valens. That's going to be 363 to 378. So this is all in the 4th century. And the Theodosius the first, you're going to have anti-paganism until the collapse of the Western Empire, even with the fall of of Rome, it's at that time opposing paganism. So in the latter part of the fourth century, there were clearly a significant number of pagan sympathizers and crypto pagans still in positions of power in all levels of administrative systems, including positions closer to the emperor. Even by the sixth century, pagans can still be found in prominent positions of office, both locally and in the imperial bureaucracy. So after the fall of the Western Empire in 476, Winodiacer uh, becomes the first barbarian king of Italy, and, and the Goths had been Christians for over 100 years. So, so this guy named Peter Brown says, um, it would be profoundly misleading to claim that the cultural and social changes that took place in late antiquity reflected in any way an overall process of Christianization of the empire. Instead, the flowering of a vigorous public culture that polytheists is Polytheists, Jews and Christians alike, could share. It could be described as Christian only in the narrowest sense had developed. It is true that Christians had ensured that blood sacrifice played no part in that culture, but the sheer success and unusual stability of the Constantinian and post-Constantinian state also ensured that the edges of potential conflict were blurred. It would be wrong to look for further signs of Christianization at this time. It is impossible to speak of a Christian empire as existing before Justinian. So that, that would sort of lend to what we're saying. So obviously this indignation that's continuing, this hatred, this anger, we would have to find, we'd have to find more evidence for it. So we, so we have something here that we don't have specific events or anything. We would just have to be that it continues to exist until the sixth century. So when it says um, has indignation against the Holy Covenant, it can't be about trying to destroy Christianity. Angela has a comment there. I'm not sure. Not sure how that that relates to this. But can we see just that paganism continues to exist and has indignation? That is it. It is anger towards the gospel. So it's not about persecuting doesn't try to destroy Christianity. How how would we put that then? There's one way you could connect it to the what it says that because you have there a return and then you have indignation against the Holy Covenant. Maybe yeah. could you maybe see that for repeating a lot and enlarged when it says, Yeah, so shall he do. He shall return and have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. Could that not really at the end to somehow the, to that indignation? Okay. Sort of well, there's, there's, a parallel, there's a parallelism here. Gre- grieved return and have indignation. So shall he do return and have intelligence. But these are different powers at this time because we're saying that, I mean, because my understanding is the one that's going to have intelligence 
with a pot with those that forsake the holy covenant is is western rome this is the mixing this is the transition from paganism to papalism would would you agree with me there yes okay so it shows that basically what what happens with paganism in its the fact that it continues but it also morphs into christianity right that that's what's being described here i mean that to me has always been clear so how would you how would you put this then how would you so paganism uh hates uh, though it coexists with christianity right so they're going to coexist at this time i'll do it this way so when it says so shall he do he shall even return and have intelligence how how would you mark this what would you do with this Stephen? Yeah, I'm trying to think, because you have there, the emperors would be sort of professing Christian, but somehow maybe representing pagan Rome in some way. Okay. Is that what you're saying? And then they're, they're kind of involved in synods going on. They say, okay, let's have a, a synod, Laodicea, Laodicea, Laodicea or Ephesus or all these places. I think they're kind of the, the initiate some of them synods. Mm. Um, for instance, Emperor Theodosius II called for two synods in Ephesus, one and four, three one. Okay, so, four, four, so Theodosius, what, what is he doing? Okay, so where three what? Uh, four three one and four four nine, and he's addressing okay. the teaching teachings of the patriarch of Constantinople. Historious and similar teachings. So they're sort of dealing with controversies going on around that time. Right. So, so we have these different controversies. Now, so one of the problems, you know, that, that Christianity is having at this time is there still is the influence of paganism, as we know, right? Christianity, once it's accepted by the state, and I put those in quotation marks, because you know, under Constantine, there's going to be, he's going to stop this persecution of Christians, per se. But still, there is this, this tension between those that are Christians and those that are not. Social pressures, all this type of stuff that exists. And what's going to happen is that Christianity is going to change, right? I mean, it already had begun, the mystery of iniquity had already begun in, in Paul's day. But we're going to see this change in Christianity, moving from what we would call Christianity to Catholicism, right? And even that change continues even after, you know, 538. I mean, Rome continues to to change in in you know in its form of worship and, and different things. But these, this paganism it becomes incorporated into Catholicism, into Christianity. So there's a lot of history in here in this one verse, right? So this verse is dealing with the fall of Western Rome and addressing that how paganism becomes dressed in Christian garb, right? So, so let's look at more specifics here, Stephen. So, so do you agree with the idea that they, um, the idea is he shall be grieved and return is addressing uh, should we still have 410 AD in there as the return, or would we put something else? Because we have 395 AD for grieved. He shall return that he's it's going to come and fight against it. But paganism will continue to have indignation during this this period, even after even after the fall of Western Rome. In 476. Does that make sense? That part, at least. Well, that's what the text seems to be saying, yes. Um, okay, okay, good. So then when we deal with the next part, so shall he do. Now, that that's kind of a vague expression. I mean, it's a very common word. Um, that's why, you know, sometimes they'll have, to, you know, so shall he do, or he shall do exploits, right? They try to add something to that. But what is this doing and who is he that's doing it? Are we just going to address, address paganism by itself? Is this paganism doing 
of returning and having intelligence with apostate Christianity, with the Catholic Church. So it's not, it's no longer pagan Rome because it's going to be after the fall of Rome. So we have here pagan Rome, but maybe it should just be paganism. So this is this philosophy that exists from the shell of of Rome. It's the thing that built up Rome. Rome is going to fall, but paganism still exists and it's going to take on this new form. So how would we, so is the he then pagan Rome or is the he just paganism? Right. So if I put he paganism. Well, I would still say it's like paganism within the Western Roman Empire. Yeah, it's within Western Rome, but the thing is, it's going to be after 476, after the last Western Roman emperor. So paganism still exists. And that's why, you know, so shall he do continue to oppose Christianity or continue to persecute. I mean, it doesn't have the state power, but maybe I could just say, you know, continue social paganism, continue because that, that can be the sense of the Hebrew word. And, and in this, um, so I would just put after 476 and then he's going to return. So can we we mark a specific place where he returns? Could this year intelligence not be sort of taking place even before uh, the fall of Western Rome? Well, it, it, it definitely does, but I think it's more after the fall of Western Rome. What this is describing is the way that paganism tries to survive, right? Yes. Because now paganism, the only way it can survive is to morph into Christianity. Right. Before it tried to to keep paganism. Right. That's why they had those revivals in the fourth century to try to bring about, um, you know, to, to hold on to these pagan practices. But here at this point, they can't do that. So now they're going to have intelligence with them that forsake the Holy Covenant. So before they had indignation, but now they, they have bedfellows, for lack of a better word that I can think of. In, in Catholicism, that is, a lot of the, the basic principles of paganism can still be practiced, but they have to be practiced within this new religion, and that would be the intelligence that they have. So by the time we get to the 6th century, we now have a Christianity that really is just paganism. It's really no different. Except that, you know, it doesn't do animal sacrifices. It still has all the forms and ceremonies. And this would help understand verse 31 and up to verse 36 and 37 and so forth. When it's going to describe the papacy. How's, how's that sound? Anybody else? Stephen, of course, uh, knows this history pretty good. Is there, is there some specific thing? That yeah, as a former Catholic, I can. Yeah, I agree with you. I, and I cringe when you say. Paganism more morphed into Christianity. The leper doesn't change his thoughts. All they did was take all the trappings and all all of the rituals and modify them somewhat. And and uh, the gods were changed. You know. Yeah. yeah. They just it's, decided it's, oh, we're going to call this statue instead of the statue to Jupiter. And it'll be Peter. And on and on it goes. Right. So what we have is we have uh, paganism and renamed. Yeah. It's it's. Paganism dressed up yes. in Christian. In Christianity. Right. Exactly. So, and that's what so I told, it, told my mom. And of course, being sent to me by the, to me by the Jesuit, she was absolutely furious. And that's when all the traps started to es- escalate. So yeah, yeah I can yeah. see how this program works. Yeah. So, but, and, and we understand that about this verse. That's what it's been telling us. The question is, how do we specifically look at these different words? So like, so when it says, so shall he do, I mean, I say, well, that's paganisms. This is the actions of paganism now that Rome has fallen. So paganism is still continuing, but it's not continuing in overt paganism. It's now coalescing with the Christianity that really is just paganism. And because one of the things we see about the Catholic Church is it it has a characteristic of Rome, right? And that's its syncretism. 
So Rome, you know, they don't, they didn't go in and, and conquer peoples like Babylon did where, you know, you're just going to, you know, and, and, and Assyria and so forth and other nations in the past where you overthrow a people and you just uh, get rid of all their gods and they now have to follow everything that you're doing. You, you basically adapt uh, the religions that you conquer or you adapt the nations that you conquer. And for the Catholic Church, <coughs> it's those religions. They mix them together. So Catholicism, you know, if it's in Mexico, it's going to have characteristics of Mexican pagan worship or whatever that existed before the Catholics were there, right there, whatever the the peoples were. Or if you're in India, it's going to adapt to um, you know Indian culture, right? So, th- so this is a characteristic that comes from Rome that the papacy has, and uh, paganism here is, is existing, and the Catholic Church is just following that same practice. It it continues to want to be popular. In order to be popular, we could just say it's just a result of human nature. Uh, you don't want to put too much of a cross on people. You want people to to have um, a Christianity that's comfortable. It conforms to their natural desires and wants. We see that today in Christianity. I mean, Christianity right, doesn't present a cross for many people. And it used to be... Embracing, what's that, Jeff? We used to see them embracing LGBTQ and all kinds of stuff. Oh, yeah. But, I mean... It, it, I mean, that was the thing when I became an Adventist. There was, you know, you have to keep the Sabbath and there's things you have to, you know, eat or not eat. And, but as time goes on, the requirements to be, become an Adventist become lessened and lessened. The standards keep becoming lowered, right? So you don't even really have to make much of a lifestyle change or any change to become a Seventh-day Adventist nowadays. And, and and same to be a Christian. I mean, people can become Christians and, you know, they don't have to change hardly anything. It's, you know, it. I mean, you, you change your friends and you change some of your activities and you might change a few things here and there. But they're not going to be things that are a major cross. I mean, they're always going to be the things that are that are are good for you, that are easy to do in the sense that, you know, your life is going to be better. Your marriage is going to be better. Your health is going to be better. Those types of things. And so we always present Christianity to people in a way that it's about a type of self-improvement that doesn't really require a great sacrifice. But in the past, to be a Christian required a great sacrifice, often your life. It and so, still does, and people will argue with that. That's why I'm repulsed by what I see around. Yeah, well, but... When I talk to a certain person and say that we need to be converted daily... It's like, oh, it's a horrible thing. It's so, it's so beyond their comprehension. Like, you, I cannot have fellowship with people like that. They don't know a thing about dying daily, Luke 9, 23 and 24. Well, yeah, well, that's not, yeah, daily. Is, I struggle with it, but I know this is a requirement right. of Christ. Right. So we know that, that, that uh, the gospel goes contrary to our nature. Uh, but we know that it, the Christianity of today uh, appeals to human nature. I mean, that was the thing when I went to an evangelistic series. Um, I saw that they were actually appealing to people's nature in uh, rather than, you know, just to become an Adventist. And, and, and for many Adventists, this is the problem that I see. And I've, s- I've said it many times. It's it just that you become part of this special group, right? So it's, it's more you're appealing to, to human pride and ego. So we use that bait to draw people in. But that continues. That's why there's all these conspiracy theories and all these winds of doctrine, because people just continue on the type of people that are Adventists are people who want to be special. And we're no different than the world because the world's like that as well. So we're worldly and we don't understand what worldliness is. We think worldliness is certain practices, but worldliness is something having to do with the heart. And so it's easy to think that we're converted, that we're not worldly because, you know, we don't do certain practices. And yet 
were just as worldly or even worse than many worldlings, right? Because they don't know better. And, and we have an attitude that really is, it's just part of our human nature. It's just part of the world. It's the elements of the world that are controlling us. So anyway, yeah. So we know this about this verse. Um, but just to try to be more specific where we can place this now, I know I got some of this I have to correct because I have one is a present truth application that's not in red. So that should be there. And we needed to finish up some things here. So, I mean, we're, we're trying to work on the present truth application of this verse. But in order to do that, we really need to understand the historic application. So we can see that if, if we're going to say at continue after 476 AD, that paganism continues, what is the parallel to our history? So when has Rome fallen and why does, uh, because there's different ways that we could look at this. So one is we could look at the fall of, of Western Rome with what ha- happens after 1798. So I'm just saying Babylon continues after 1798, right? So we're saying, so that's the fall of Western Rome, 476 AD, and we're going to parallel that with 1798. Is that, is that reasonable? So the, the papacy receives a deadly wound in 1798. Okay, or could we say that uh, papal thinking maybe is better? Even though the papacy has fallen, right, there still is, you know, these people that become part of Babylon, Protestantism. I don't know if that's the best way to look at it. Well, it definitely has because, I mean, I try to share the the spirit spirit of of, of prophecy with somebody, and he's a seminary. And then, of course, it's the evangelical Protestant teaching, you know. And I said, I took some of that and I found out it has a great deal of false theology. And he was so offended. But it's true. So I handed him a copy of the great controversy. And he had it for maybe a week or two and then gave it back without comment. So I thought, well, that pretty well says it all. And I said, some people want the truth and some people don't. They would prefer to keep the doctrines of their church, even though the Bible and the spirit of prophecy which was well, the, the same spirit of okay. contradicts them. Uh, this is the battle we're all going through, you know. Things that okay. uh, mindsets from secular secularism and ma- mindsets from false theology and all sorts of things. And we have to compare everything to the Word of God and ask God to help us put on the mind of Christ and to sift through it all. What is truth and what is falsehood? And if we're not sure then what are the effects of believing such and such? And they're certainly not good. Like last night I was thinking about what what the spirit of prophecy says about when a Catholic sins. Well, it doesn't matter what they do. All they have to do is go back to the priest and confess. Therefore, there's all these abominations that keep recurring and recurring and recurring. Yeah, well, we, do we have that same kind yeah, of so we could, Often we do. Yeah, so we could focus. I mean, obviously, we know all that exists. But that doesn't help us here with this interpretation of, of what we're well, trying to do. Well, it does, because I'm just see, seeing how deep set these... Um, in- oh, I understand that. But I'm just saying... Well, so we I, I, I'm seeing it right around me. ...phrases in, in this history that we need to put dates to, is all I'm saying. So... Yeah, it, it well, all I'm plot. speaking more of a general <laughs> sense, and you're trying to get the historical... Right. Exactly. Well, I mean, accurate date. I don't know all this stuff. I only see what I, what is repercussing right now, personally around me. You know. Yes. Yeah, so we have we have with the uh, we have the general idea of what this verse is about, but I want more specific. So when we say you know he that is paganism shall return. Yeah. I tell- well, I need some dates for that. I need some events, at least. When does paganism return? When does it have intelligence? Now, I it would never say, left. The fact is, it never left. The I ideology know. has never left. We understand and that, but we still, we, still more need, and more. we still need dates for these for these things, right? So we still need a date because we have a date for he shall do, right? So this is just saying paganism after 476. 
And then it says he shall even return. And so we want to know, well, is there some way in which paganism is said to return? Now, you know, when we deal with 1798 and the fall of Rome, there was a suggestion, and I think this probably would apply. You know, we could put this in 1929, right? Because this is going to be the, the papacy. What, what, I can't remember what they call it now. Um, it's the, what, what's the date? What's the event in 1929? What do they call it? Lateran Treaty. The Lateran Treaty. The Lateran Treaty. Now, so that would make sense, right? The Lateran Treaty. And then he has his intelligence. Now we put there John Paul II. So we're, we're dealing with the present truth application here. Um, that's why I have this, should put this in red. And so we got the period from the Lateran Treaty. Um, what's the date of the Lateran Treaty? We have a specific date. Uh, somebody can hear me. We know the year, but I'm not sure of the date. That's uh, February. February, what date? We should have all this memorized. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. February what? What comes up on my screen is June 7th, 1929. But I mean, I haven't even read this in ages, right? Okay. For the Lateran Treaty. Yeah, the Lateran Treaty. It was 40 days, <laughs> 40 years before my birthday. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to look this up. So you're saying it's February 7th, 1929. I'm is ridiculous. June 27th, 1929. So it actually has, yeah, so we got February 11th and we have June 7th. It says here, uh, the Vatican's focus on international diplomacy had become more and more keenly appreciated in the impressive gestures of His Holiness Pope Pius XI on the morrow <laughs> of his election to the Supreme Pontificate presaged ulterior developments for which the world was not therefore wholly unprepared. The stage was set for the drama of events which was enacted in Rome between the dates of February 11th and June 7th, 1929. Okay. Um, so those are the dates that we have. And, and that's kind of interesting. Uh, so we have two significant dates. Now we're going to see that, John Paul and Reagan meet on June 7th, 1982. So that's going to be uh, February 11th is going to be 40 years before Stephen is born. And then uh, June 7th is going to be, was it 53 years? June 7th, 1929 to 82. So 53 years. Okay. Now that doesn't help us with the historic application, but at least we have the present truth application here. So we, we might be able to get something from this with spans of time. It's uh, the 53 years, it's 19,358 days. Yeah, so that's um, 476 years after the fall of Eastern Rome. Um, I didn't quite catch what you, for um, the fall of. So it's 476 years after the fall of Eastern Rome. Or after, uh, oh, okay. Okay, so from, four, so from 476 to 1929, that what you're counting? 1453. 1953. Oh, oh, 53, 1453, minus 1929. So you're talking about Eastern Rome. Okay. Okay, I see what you're saying. So you got, oh, yeah, and you did this on a chart, right? Yes. Okay, so, so we have 476. A.D. is the fall of Western Rome, and then 1453 is the fall of Eastern Rome, when Constantine the Eleventh is um, dies, right? The last Eastern Roman Empire emperor, and then it's going to be 476 years to the Lateran Treaty. So this will be really nice for a chart. You know, once we get this line drawn out, you'll see how that makes a lot of sense. Okay, so it's 116 days from. February 11th, 1929 to June 7th, 1929. And what does 11, 11, 6 represent? Anybody? Uh, maybe a lot of 16th day of the first month. It's, it's what? I, it's, it's distorted sometimes. Our first month, 16th day, maybe? Okay, well, it can be. But it's also 9 11, right? If you just flip it over end on end. Okay. Right. Or 
if you just uh, reorder reorder it, right? So so it represents 9-11 and 11-9, but it also does work, represent the 16th day of the first month. Okay, so anyway, there's there's that interesting span of time. And then we have... So that would be like, a you'd have a resurrection symbolized then? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the 16th day of the first month, you get a resurrection. So there's 19,358 19, days from June 7th to, well, in 29 to 82. So we're going to have to think about some of these things here a bit more. But, um, you know, especially when we start drawing these things up, we're going to see some good structures between the past, it, both in drawing out uh, this from the the historic and the present truth application of the connection, right? Because we have the fall of Eastern and Western Rome that we can tie to this period of time. Um, so that's going to be good. Now, we also had uh, some spans of time that we're going to look at uh, later. So, and if I remember correctly, there was this, uh, we had uh, 13,431, and I can't remember... I always forget which one that was. And it was it was taking, I think it was, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation. I think those three words added together gave us 13,431. And we counted those. But maybe we should uh, deal with this return, have, uh, he shall do, return and have intelligence. So we'll just show you. What I'm going to do here. So what I would do is I would add together these Hebrew numbers. So he shall do is six two one three, return seven seven two five, and have intelligence with five nine two. So that's nineteen thousand eight hundred and fifty nine. So there's something something here. Now if we go from uh, so we were counting the number of days between, so 19,474 days from February 11th, 1929 to June 7th, 1982. And the number that we have, if we take those, is 18,859. So 19,000 minus, it's 385 difference. So I'm going to deal with this kind of stuff later. I know it's kind of tedious to watch me do math when you can't really see what I'm doing or thinking. Um, but I do think there's some kind of relationship here between these these numbers and these spans of time. And then they, uh, so they shall return. They do that right. So shall you do return? Oh, I, yeah. It should actually be 995. So I have six, two, three, plus, plus, um, have intelligence. Okay, I'm going to deal with this later on. Okay, so I think we got somewhere today. Uh, we're just going to have to try to finish this off. We might, what we might do is draw this out on a line, uh, before we even get to verse 31, just get verse 30 drawn on a line by itself and see the connections between this history and the present truth application. And that might help us a little bit. Any final thoughts? So let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning and uh, for each person that participated. We ask for your spirit to continue to show us our need of you and forgive us for our sins and help us to trust in all the things that you are doing. In spite of what we see happening around us and the discouragements and trials that we face, we ask, Lord, that we can be faithful in all things. Bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.